They are the most corrupt government I have ever even contemplated. You know, I'm 50 years old, so I've seen a few governments come and go. They're so corrupt that they don't care that we know they're corrupt. I am a husband, a father, a lawyer, a Christian, and a proud Canadian. I started this series because it was clear that our nation needs truth. Not just another biased narrative, but real information of substance. We need access to facts and the freedom to think for ourselves. I'm Leighton Gray, and this is Gray Matter. You know, what it is like for somebody to get dropped into a tornado right in the middle of it and try to make some sense of it. Originally, when I started the project, I just wanted to focus only on the convoy. But when I went to the Public Order Emergency Commission and I heard all the testimony because I sat in that audience for seven weeks and I listened to what the government and the police thought and I compared that to what we were doing, I had to write about those things. I had to do like a, a, a comparison of, of what they did versus what we did and what we were thinking versus what they were thinking and highlight what the end result was and why. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Grey Matter. Well, as you've gathered, we're going to be talking today about the Freedom Convoy and uh, we have a real treat for you today. We have uh, a man on the show who was part of the, the sort of executive team uh, who was right there on the ground uh, leading the charge, as it were, in terms of the Freedom Convoy. And uh, he's written a very fascinating book about it. And I'm, we're going to explain why his book is, is different than some of the other ones that have been written about the Freedom Convoy and why it's important that Canadians read it. His name is Tom Morazzo. Thanks for being on the show today, Tom. It's a pleasure to have you on Grey Matter. Yes, thank you very much for having me. And and I got to say, I think you're one of the first people to interview me about the book who's actually read the book. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, uh, guests yeah. on the show are always surprised that I never have anybody on here who's read a book, uh, whose book I've not read. And uh, mm -hmm. a big part right. of it is, uh, I think it's important for, for in order for me to have a meaningful mm -hmm. conversation with you about the book, it's important that I've read the book and, and have something to, to offer about it, uh, at least in terms of impressions and things like that. So uh, it was my pleasure to read your book. And uh, I'm you. very grateful to you for having taken the time because um, I've said on this program many times that I think that the Freedom Convoy is the most important uh, political and cultural event that has happened in this century. Perhaps uh, it, it's in the top five in the history of our country. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's important for us to make sense of it. I think that we're going to be talking about the Freedom Convoy for a very, very long time. And uh, I think it's very important for people like you who have intimate knowledge of it to provide, you know, a perspective on it so that the rest of us who weren't there and only saw it from a distorted uh, distance uh, so that we get a better understanding of what happened there. And so I'm really hopeful that uh, during this hour with you, we're going to get sort of a, a bit of a, of a summary and understanding of, of, uh, of your book and, and uh, what it says and why it's important. Uh, before we go there and, and sort of dive into it, as we always do, we have some framing aphorisms to get to. Uh, the first one is uh, a meme, and this is a very familiar one from the Freedom Convoy period. It says, are you too dumb to understand science? Don't care if you get sick and die. Could you care less if you get other people, including your own family, kids and strangers sick and possibly killed? Do you want to keep the pandemic going forever? giving COVID every chance to mutate and get worse? Are you too big a baby to get another shot? Then join this bunch of idiots and prove you're a moron too. That's a sampling of what people like Tom were dealing with at the time. Here's one that's, um, that's uh, maybe a little more supportive. It says, truck drivers have hit the proverbial wall and every tactile thing in your life is moved by them. This goes far beyond the mandate issue. That's just the snapping point for many. There are many factors at play, truckers being the constant proverbial scapegoat for a crumbling supply chain is front and center. I want to be clear that this has been brewing for decades. That's from an anonymous uh, contributor. Mm -hmm. Here's something from a former Chief Justice, of our, the longest serving Chief Justice in this country, Beverly McLaughlin, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, wrote an opinion piece in which she said, freedom is not unlimited, and the trucker protest in Ottawa showed 
an ugly side of freedom. Freedom without limits slides imperceptibly into freedom to say and do what you want about people who don't look like you or talk like you. Sadly, the Ottawa Truckers Convoy has revealed this ugly side of freedom. That's what she wrote. The sitting Supreme Court uh, Chief Judge of our Supreme Court, uh, Justice Wagner, in an interview with Le Devoir, characterized the protest on Wellington Street, where Parliament and Supreme Court are located as, quote, the beginning of anarchy, where some people have decided to take other citizens hostage. That article reported that Wagner had also declared that, quote, forced blows against the state, justice and democratic institutions like the one delivered by protesters should be denounced with force by all figures of power in the country, end quote. And then finally, from the, who, the man I consider to be the, the greatest living Canadian journalist, Rex Murphy, he said this, mm -hmm. in the early days of COVID, truckers were being sung as heroes. That melody has ceased. It should be restarted. So who do we have on the show today? Well, Tom Marazzo. Uh, Tom has been uh, dedicated to serving Canadians since 1990 when he joined the Army Reserve while still in high school. Eight years later, he enrolled in the regular force army and was granted the commission of combat engineer officer, soon rising to the level of captain. Tom worked in the division engineer office in Toronto, where, where he participated in the G8 G20 summit in 2010. While in the military, Tom earned a diploma in construction engineering technology and architecture and an MBA. He has been posted to, to various locations across Canada. Uh, and after 25 years of service, Tom retired from the armed forces in 2015, the same year that we got Justin Trudeau. He completed a four-year Bachelor of Technology software development a a degree and immediately began teaching at a community college in Ontario until September of 2021. We're going to talk about this on the show mm -hmm. when he was fired for questioning the legality of vaccine mandates via campus-wide email to the president and members of the college faculty. He has uh, described himself, quite accurately in my opinion, as someone determined to stand for the rights and freedoms of Canadians. Tom became a volunteer of the Canadian Trucker Freedom Convoy in 2022. Trained in battle planning over many years, Tom's tactical and strategic advice was instrumental to the safe and responsible achievement of convoy objectives. His experience was integral to the coordination of truck movements and logistics, as well as negotiations with police and liaison teams from the city of Ottawa. He has most recently read, uh, written uh, uh, an incredible book that I've had the pleasure of uh, reading, and I encourage all of you to read. In fact, I urge you to. Uh, it's called The People's Emergency Act, the Freedom Convoy 2022, and I'm happy to report it is, in fact, a number one bestseller in this country, and it's now available in hardcover and paperback. So, Tom, uh, could we go back maybe to the beginning of things um, to uh, what happened when you were at Georgian College? Because I think that's mm -hmm. uh, an important, uh, maybe a seminal moment for you uh, when yes. you became sort of awakened uh, to, the, to what was going on in the country and how you could contribute to change. Because it seems to me without that happening, you probably wouldn't have gotten involved with the Freedom Convoy. Would you agree with that? I would absolutely agree with that because I, as a result of getting fired from Georgian, I was basically forced to sell my house Oh, really? and relocate. Yeah. We ended up relocating about 300 kilometers away, um, uh, towards the Kingston area. We purchased land, uh, with the intention eventually of building a home on the land and we were starting to look seriously at a parallel society uh, wow. because I wasn't the only one. I wasn't, you know, there are, I was in a meeting last night online with a group of people that are saying, I, I don't think that they're done with this stuff and people are hedging their bets and they're looking at creating parallel economies because they don't trust the Canadian economy anymore. They don't trust the, the robustness of it. Right. And so I was in the same exact position. And at the time, you know, you got to remember... New Brunswick and Quebec were looking at putting guards on grocery stores to stop people from buying food who didn't have a vax pass. Right. Yes. You know, yeah. and and we couldn't go to restaurants. You couldn't go to various public places if you didn't prove that you were um, you had taken this ex ex experimental injection. 
So it was a very scary time. And if, had I not been fired, I wouldn't have been forced to purchase my house, relocate. And when I relocated, I met a couple of people that were at the time had no connection to the convoy because it wasn't a thing yet. But those people had relationships with, with other groups. And that is how I ended up being called. I, Mm -hmm. I answered a phone call, uh, from a friend of mine just to see if I could help out now that the convoy had arrived in Ottawa two days prior. Mm -hmm. So that's why, yeah, if I didn't get fired, I I would not have been called. I wouldn't have been connected to anybody associated with the convoy. And you, so your stand at Georgian college where you were an instructor was essentially against the vaccine mandates that were being imposed Mm -hmm. on faculty and students. Is that right? Yes. And they, it was in September. It was the first week of September. Students had already paid, you know, registered for courses, paid tuitions. Then they came out and implemented a mandate just prior to classes starting. Mm. And so it was really about the first week of school, the beginning, like I think a few days before the beginning of the semester started when they had already captured everybody's money in registrations and took away all their options to go elsewhere. And they, the president sent out a a campus wide email and I looked at that email and I said, absolutely not. Like the law is not on your side. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how you think you're going to get around all of these different areas of Canadian legislation. And so I basically wrote an email reply and it sent it out to everybody that I could think of to put on this email. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as a result, I got fired for cause a couple of days later for sending that email. And Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, I didn't get to the point where I, I refused to get the job, which I would have, uh, I got fired because I publicly, and I mean, internally to the college questioned the mandates. Uh, and I said, how do you think you're going to get around even basic informed consent? Yeah. Uh, because right now you can't even meet the basic test for informed consent. So how do you think you're going to get around it? Um, and as a result, there was no discussion about the points in my letter. It was, I got fired, uh, for cause because I violated their spamming, uh, policy. Mm. And then I openly criticized, I openly criticized a new policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) So, yeah. Tom, I, I had, I went through a cancel culture experience my, myself, uh, that was analogous to what you sort of experienced at Georgian college. And I had the sensation and this may, this may be, it reveals my own naivete, but at the time that I said some things publicly about the way that judges are being selected in this country. Mm. I thought Mm -hmm. that I was living in the Canada that I grew up in. And I, so I thought that I never imagined that my views would result in, uh, in being attacked by the, you know, by, by the CBC, by, you know, Justin Trudeau's, uh, uh, you know, henchman, Mr. Faber Mm -hmm. from U of T. I I didn't imagine all that would happen to me. I wonder Mm -hmm. in that Georgian, in the, in that Georgian college situation, were you in that mindset as well? Were you functioning under some naivete or did you know at that time, you know, you, you were sort of crossing, crossing over the threshold and that this probably mm-hmm. could be something that would get, get a silver bullet shot at you. That's a great question because what my actual original goal of that email was I knew that there was a lot of faculty out there that were very uncomfortable with what was happening, but they all felt isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It worked really well to isolate and make Canadians feel alone. So I didn't think that anybody um, who was uh, uncomfortable realized that there was a group of other people that were feeling the same. We weren't organized. Mm -hmm. And so my, my goal was I sent it out to all these faculty expecting that some of them would say, yeah, you know, this guy's right. And I agree with what he's saying. That's not what happened at all. (laughs) In fact, it was just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say the vast majority of the faculty at Georgian college on that particular email turned on me, uh, in a, in a very bullying sort of childish way. Right. Uh, but you know, this is what you're going to expect with, with certain college faculty in Ontario, that 
will not go against the grain because they're too tired for their cushy jobs. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the reality of the situation. They're not going to rock the boat and disrupt their paychecks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're not, then they're going to just fall in line. Yeah. Uh, doesn't matter how ridiculous a policy is. Doesn't matter how illegal it is. Uh, they're going to fall in line if they're told to do it because they're afraid of losing their jobs. Yeah. Thomas Sowell has a great quotation about this. He says, anyone who studies the history of ideas should notice how much more often people on the political left, college professors, more so than others, denigrate and demonize those who disagree with them instead of answering their arguments. It seems to me what happened to you at Trojan College is a great example of that. So anyway, it was was sort of a blessing in a way because, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it sort of set you off on a very important uh, course, didn't it? Mm -hmm. It did. And I, you know, originally when I did get called to go to the convoy, my expectation was I would go for a couple days. Uh, You know, I packed clothes for five days just in case it got prolonged. But I'd go for a couple days, I'd find somebody really smart, and I'd say, (laughs) okay, here, you take over, and I'm going to head home. Right. Uh, That's what my expectation was. Mm -hmm. And it turned out I was there for 22 days. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot longer than I had anticipated. We had a similar conversation with Chris Barber on the show, Mm -hmm. Uh, but he Mm -hmm. had a different, uh, a bit of a different sensation than you in the sense that uh, he didn't think it was going to last very long, but when he got to Ottawa, he had no idea what to do with himself. Um, mm-hmm. But your reaction from reading the book was very different. And I think that has a mm-hmm. lot to do with the way that uh, you are trained militarily. Yes. You are a tactical, yes. not only a tactical thinker, you're a tactical mm-hmm. expert. You're an expert in that. Mm-hmm. And you sort of, it, I got the impression from reading the book, you sort of adopted the, uh, the maxim, see a need, fill a need. And when you recognize very quickly that people like Chris Barber needed direction uh, Mm -hmm. and that uh, no one else was going to step into that, into that void, into that breach. And so you did. And so you, Mm -hmm. you, uh, you recognize that very early on and you became very much a part of the active brain of the convoy. And the other thing I got from your book, which is very valuable, is um, that things actually on the ground uh, were very well organized when you consider the let's say the amount of tumult uh, that was going on at the time. There were a lot of factors you couldn't control, but you were very much involved in controlling what you could control. I got that sense from you, the way you describe uh, things in the book. Is that a fair assessment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very fair. Um, There are certain things that you, you have to understand that you can't control, but you might be able to influence and, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this before. There's these three circles that I, I try to follow. There's the f- circle of control, the circle of influence, and really the circle of interest. You have no control over your circle of interest, but you can monitor it. Right. But if you have a circle of influence, but you don't necessarily control it, your, your objective should be to see if there's a way for you to control what you're influencing, because ultimately the, the only thing that you have available at your fingertips are the things that you can directly control. So you have to understand which circle things sort of fit. And if I, I would like for people to start in this country that are, are on this side of, of what's happening in Canada, I'd like them to spend a lot less time on their circle of, of um, interest, let's say, and go down less rabbit holes. Mm-hmm. Focus more on your circles of influence and definitely what you can control. Because if you can't control it and you can't influence it, why are you spending the vast amount of your energy on things that that really you can't do anything about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I looked at the convoy in very much the same way. Um, and, you know, it did take me a long time, longer than I expected to figure out who everybody was when I arrived there. Cause I didn't know anybody. I didn't know a single person And the person who brought me there, James Botter, I had a 15 minute phone call with him and I couldn't pick him out of a police lineup. <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, that's the only person I knew when I arrived there. And then as time went on, I, I could figure out who was, who, who was talk and who was somebody who actually could deliver. Right. And that took quite a while. And, you know, when I look at, 
Uh, I didn't know who Chris Barber was. I didn't know who Tamara was. I didn't know any of the, the big name social media players. I had no idea who they were. But once I figured it out and I understood how people responded to them and what they liked to do, what, you know, the, the things they were involved in, that's where I knew it's like, okay, Chris is the tool for this job. Tamara is the tool for that job. I'll go talk to them and see how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was very careful to never be in a position where I was ordering people to do things. I see. You know, I, I tried to give my counsel, mm -hmm. uh, and advise them on the best course of action and see if that made sense to them. And if it did good, if it didn't, I've got to live with the decision because I didn't start the convoy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm there, I'm there to volunteer and to help it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's kind of the approach that I took. Mm -hmm. One of, one of the things that you couldn't control, but became mm -hmm. very important, uh, was the media reaction, the way the media was, was reporting this and not only the media, the Ottawa police, I pulled a tweet from the audio, uh, Ottawa police and said, uh, protesters, we told you to leave. We gave you time to leave. We were slow and methodical. Yet you were assaultive and aggressive with the officers and the horses. Based on your behavior, we are <laughs> responding by including helmets and batons for our safety. Here's another one. Mm. This is reported by Ottawa police. She tweeted out, protesters were assaulting officers with weapons, warranting the deployment of mid-range impact weapons, A-R-W-E-N, mm. to stop the violent actions of the protesters. Um, this, is, this is clearly false, right? Yes. Uh, but, you, yes. but here you have the Ottawa police totally misrepresenting what was going on on the ground. Then you had the mass media uh, doing likewise in, in unison. Were you shocked by that? I was. Uh, I was shocked and in, in very disappointed in the dishonesty. Yeah. Uh, every time we tried to have a, a contact with the Ottawa police in particular, we tried to not engage in deception. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing because we wanted, we wanted the police on our side, not to say, Hey, uh, you know, we're going to start protesting with you. That's not what I mean, but we wanted them to say, Hey, as long as everything is safe and responsible, we are not going to arrest you. We are going to actually uphold your section two charter, right? Which is to peacefully assemble. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's one of the rights in the, in that section. Yeah. And so we thought it's better to have them as a partner than to be in direct opposition with the police. Cause that just gives them justified, uh, you know, justifies their ability to use more kinetic energy against protesters. Right. So when I, when I hear about these, these, um, these tweets that they put out, I mean, these are outright lies yeah. and you have to remember Police forces, uh, police departments do have access to behavioral science teams. Mm -hmm. uh, police engage in psychological warfare. They have a different name for it, but they do engage in psychological warfare. Uh, they do engage in psychological uh, and behavioral science operations. That's normal. And I, and I don't, I don't uh, criticize that. I'm just saying that they understand how to manipulate public sentiment. Mm -hmm. uh, they use it for fighting crime or that they're supposed to. But in this particular case, what's disturbing is that they would actively tell lies against a peaceful protest that they knew to be peaceful. Right. And I'll give you an example why I know they know this is because I was there when Candace and the other man got run over by the horse. I was like 15 feet away when it happened. Overhead was really? a, a UAVs. And on the roof of the Senate building, because it happened right in front of the Senate building, there was a sniper team up there with scopes, cameras, uh, and multiple police officers up there. So I knew that the UAV was recording everything. I knew mm -hmm. the snipers were recording everything. Obviously, police officers are going to have cameras there for collection of evidence when this thing goes to trial. Mm -hmm. So they had to be collecting evidence the whole entire time they were there. In the same day that Candace and the other man were run over by the horse, they lied. Chief Bell came out and actually said that they threw a bike at the, the, um, at the horse. It was a walker. They knew there was no horse. The, he knew that they were lying and he still went on national television and he did it. And they never retracted any of their lies. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And it, and it was disgusting because we were always acting in good faith with the police. And there was an incident where I had cautioned them. Uh, I was very careful not to threaten police, but I cautioned them. I said, look, uh, after the night they, they raided Coventry, um, I said, we're not going to get into tit for tat unless you guys force us into a tit for tat. But what you guys did by going and stealing uh, fuel for heaters and food uh, at Coventry, when you went and confiscated that stuff, I, I actually call it stealing. Yeah. Um, you've achieved nothing except to get more support for us from the public. Right. And you took that risk. In fact, it was so bad that they actually got into a fight over it with the OPP. The OPP really? were quite upset that the mm -hmm. Ottawa police chose to do that raid. And, you know, I said, your raid at Coventry, that's your freebie. We're yeah. not going to escalate this. We see the play. We're not stupid. We're not going to escalate it. That is your freebie. However, if you continue to do stupid things, you're going to win stupid prizes. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, we have four other installations on the outside of the city. Mm. And if you want... We will start doing stupid things, but we're never going to exceed the level that you bring it to. Mm -hmm. So if you want to play games, we'll play games, but we hope that you rethink your strategy and don't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the most part, they rethought it. I think the OPP were quite upset at the Ottawa police for doing what they did. Um, so we didn't see too much of that, but we did see the lying in the, in the media, in the social media. Yeah. We did continue yeah. to see those lies. I, uh, my, my father-in-law, actually, we sponsored him to go to the Freedom Convoy. And so he gave us daily sort of reports about what was going on there. Like many Canadians, uh, who had access to what was happening there, we were shocked by the, by the, by the, by the obvious contrast between what we were hearing about in the mass media mm -hmm. and what was being reported to us by friends and family and on things like Facebook. But there was a mm -hmm. point at which the whole tenor of the thing really changed uh, for me, my perception of it. And that was when you and sort of the, 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 you know, the, the sort of leadership team of the convoy uh, were, were getting together on Facebook and, and were broadcasting about your concerns about mm -hmm. that uh, the police or the military were going to come in and, and forcibly shut down the convoy. That must have been uh, a very, very trying time. I know you talk about this in the book. I wonder if you could maybe share what that was like for you. I know that you're you're trained militarily, so your approach mm -hmm. to it probably was different. But that mm -hmm. must have been a very, uh, very frightening uh, time for those people who were involved in that in the leadership group. It was actually the the fear and the paranoia was very extreme at that point. And we had been uh, notified by the city through the media, in fact, that the police were going to start uh, euthanizing dogs. Like the, there was, there was uh, a lot of truckers brought their dogs that were in the truck yeah. with them. Mm -hmm. They were going to euthanize the dogs and they were going to start um, taking the children away from the truckers Yes, who were there. And, mm -hmm there was all sorts of rumors going on. And, and again, this is where I'm saying that they were using a, a form of psychological warfare against the mental health of the, the peaceful protesters. And so the rumors were going around and we did, um, we did get notified by people who knew that they were setting up a processing center for mass arrests, which we expected. I mean, uh, anybody, could have anticipated that yes they're bringing in more police we knew this we were getting reports uh there are people inside various police departments that were sympathizing with us so we were getting fed information but you had to take it with a grain of salt you didn't know if you were being lied to or not mm -hmm. but we treated it as if though okay it does make sense that they're going to come in and start making mass arrests but i kept hearing people say, look, the military is coming, the military is coming, the military. And I said, okay, th this needs to stop. So the first time I think I did a real individual or, or public statement where I did a lot of the, the speaking, um, the very first time it was, yes, I was talking to the public, but in reality, I'm sending direct messages to 
the chief of police right to the political people and very, I'm, very I'm tactical very tactical right yeah, yeah yeah and i'm and i'm talking to i'm letting the military know right that we know we understand that you don't have a mission here mm-hmm. so you know that kind of calms the nerves of of the protesters but it also tells the military like we're not, we're not saying we're calling your bro, your bluff. What we're saying is you don't have a mission here. We know it and you know it. Right. So nobody should be fueling that fire. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's nothing. Uh, I know after the fact, I had been told that they, the military was staff checking to see if they could, uh, if they were called, what kind of support would they offer? I knew this was happening at the time. It's normal standard operating procedure for the military to start uh, staff checking, looking at availability, you know, costing it, you know, what would it take to put together a team to go there? That's all normal stuff. Mm -hmm. But I knew that they didn't have a clear mission. And it wasn't outside of the control. How did you know that? That's an important point. Yeah, because I worked at the GAG 20 summit. And I learned what it was like to support when the military gets requested to support law enforcement. And in the military, we call it uh, ALIA, Assistance to Law Enforcement Agencies. I see. And so from the training and the experience that I had as a military member uh, in, you know, working with the police in the past, there was just no clear mission statement for the military that they could get involved in a clearly law enforcement, uh, type of a scenario. Mm -hmm. So going back to the GAG 20, it was pounded into us that we are not to be seen as leading a law enforcement activity, meaning that summit was in the hands under the jurisdiction of strangely enough, Bill Blair, um, at the time that the police were the lead agencies we were there in support of. Right. So I anticipated maybe the military could get called out to provide some flying kitchens to feed the police. Uh, but then I thought, no, that's kind of ridiculous. They're going to eat on the economy and they're going to spend a lot of taxpayers' money. Right. So really, ultimately, there was just never a clear mission. And as we saw, there was no mission for the Canadian military. Yeah. Uh, but it was important that people understood, like, calm down, take a breath. That's not their job. Yeah. Uh, we are not armed. We have not taken over, uh, like there's complete mobility. We have not denied access to any government official to get to the house of commons or anything like that. We haven't interrupted any critical infrastructure. We haven't blocked an international border. Uh, and we've, we've done nothing. We're on the streets. And in fact, in fact, I know because I heard the testimony from the police, all roads were open to emergency services like fire, police, and ambulance. Right. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one of the things, though, that, that did happen, and, uh, of course, you had a sense of this, I guess, maybe in hindsight, but in addition to what the Ottawa police were saying, and we heard what the two uh, Supreme Court Chief Justices said, the mm-hmm. Prime Minister and his public statements when he when he finally paid attention to the <laughs> to, to yeah. the freedom convoy he started using the language of terrorism and this was mm-hmm. a very specific per for a very specific purpose when i heard that language as a lawyer my ears pricked up because i knew immediately that that meant that they were looking at invoking emergencies act legislation in order to quell uh what they were regarding mm-hmm. as a as an uprising and uh, I actually, I mentioned my cancel culture experience. One of the reasons that I, why I got in trouble is that early on in the pandemic, uh, I, I wrote publicly that the Trudeau government was messing around with the Emergencies Act legislation. And I predicted mm-hmm. that they were going to use it at some point uh, during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Freedom Convoy ultimately created that opportunity for them. And we're still living out the effects of this. And your book talks about this. It also talks about kind of the next phase. And I don't, I don't want to gloss over what happened, how the, you know, how the Freedom Convoy was broken up, but people know about that. But I want to go forward into the actual Emergencies Act inquiry, if we can call it that. Sure. Um, I, it was obviously something of a sham. You were there. You mm-hmm. testified in it. Um, what were your impressions of that inquiry? Get you know, good, bad, ugly. What was your sense of what was going on there? 
uh, complete, uh, poli- like totally corrupt process, yeah. Yeah. Uh, grotesque, corrupt, uh, really disappointing. And, you know, I was saying to somebody this morning, the, the liberal government, uh, they are the most corrupt government I have ever ever even contemplated you know i'm 50 years old so i've seen a few governments come in i'm with you 100 percent. and yeah and i've never seen a government so corrupt they're so corrupt that they don't care that we know they're corrupt yep um and the, of course that's with the help of of jugmeet singh and if jugmeet doesn't come through for them they always fall back on the Bloc quebecois yeah and so you've got this this government these members of parliament that just don't care about the corruption. Yeah. Um, and so when I sat through that public order emergency commission, I was quite surprised in the first two and a half to three weeks. I thought it was actually going very well. Mm-hmm. And then I actually did a video on it and I said, I- I'm, I'm surprised this is going very well. And it was as if though Rulo watched my video and said, yeah, wait for Monday. Uh-huh. And it just flipped and we could see that it was, um, you know, great example, Peter Slowly, uh, the former chief of Ottawa at the time. He, I think, spent two days on the stand, two days, or at least a day and a half. Uh, I got, I think, three hours. Uh, some of the other participants got maybe three hours of testimony. But we have a guy who quit when things got really, really tough. And somehow became the focus for a day and a half of the testimony. Uh, and it was all about him and his, his lawyer. He had a very good lawyer, a very expensive lawyer, uh, who was there trying to protect him from being the fall guy for the government, which we all thought was really quite bizarre. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing that was really, really bizarre to us was the fact that you had, uh, the entire injustice department of the the (laughs) federal government hired outside counsel. Yeah. And because their own counsel wasn't good enough or wasn't up to the task. So they, they went out and got a bunch of really high priced, uh, guns to come in there and make sure that we never got to the truth that we never examined, you know, it was, it was supposed to be about examining the government's actions on the invocation of the emergencies act. The only group of people, there was uh, our lawyer, Brendan Miller, uh, Bathsheba and Eva Chipiuk. Right. And Eva was at the convoy. Uh, there was them and there were some lawyers from JCCF and a couple of other really good, uh, law teams that were there. It was a very, very small group out of the 25 groups of lawyers that were there that were focused on what the actual mandate of the commission was supposed to be about. Right. Everybody else was too busy pointing fingers. The OPP's lawyers were pointing at someone else. The Ottawa police was pointing at someone else. Nobody was getting to the heart of the matter, which was, did the government have the justification? Did they meet any of the four conditions under section two of the CSIS act? Right. The answer was no. And the reason I know it was no is because Rouleau admitted it right. in court when Haddam from the JCCF was cross-examining David Vigneault, the director of CSIS, and he was asking him about the four conditions. And Rouleau said to him something to the effect of, look, you've only got 10 minutes. I'm not sure I would have wasted my time going through each of those sections because it's been well established that they didn't meet any of them. Right. And I was like, okay, it's over. It's over right there. Like Rouleau just admitted that the government did not meet any of those conditions to invoke the act. And then his report came out and he says, yep, the government met the very high threshold to invoke the act, but somebody else more intelligent than me could have probably had a different opinion. It's like, I think half the room had a different opinion in you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I looked at that commission and I thought, what a waste of 20 plus million dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, absolute waste. And yeah. what was the outcome? Canadians got robbed of the truth. Mm-hmm. And now what is that report going to do? It's going to give Justin Trudeau and his government the top cover to go and make it better for the government to do things like invoke the emergency act over its citizens. Yeah. 
and that that's was, what it achieved. Yeah. And you talk about the the corruption. Uh, one of the concerns mm-hmm. that I had when I when I saw the the wording of the act as as a lawyer, it made it very clear that they had jerry rigged it from the very beginning. They engineered it from the back mm-hmm. end because yes. uh, there was never any way, there was never any set of facts uh, because mm-hmm. of the way the inquiry was set up whereby they could be vigorously cross-examined and brought to task. And so uh, you, you, mm-hmm. you talk about Rouleau, but really it would have been almost impossible for anyone uh, hearing that, mm-hmm. that uh, on the basis of, of the way the, the act is worded to find mm-hmm. against the government. And uh, so when you talk about corruption, that's how deep it goes, folks. It's very, very serious Mm -hmm. and very, frankly, un-Canadian. And it's shocking for people of our generation, both you and I, Tom, are both in our 50s. You know, we're old enough to remember when this was absolutely inconceivable. I mean, we've had Mm -hmm. prime ministers of, you know, questionable uh, judgment and have made mistakes in the past. But I'm with you. I've never seen this level, this level of banana republic Mm -hmm. corruption. Uh, that this liberal government engages in, and it just seems Mm -hmm. to never stop. It's as though they want to condition us to expect it from them. Yes. And this Chief Justice Wagner is, um, you know, here's the issues that I find with him. Mm -hmm. He, first of all, uh, when the governor general changed over and they had a vacant seat for a while, he was sitting in the governor general's chair while also sitting in the chief justice's chair. Yeah, Uh, I don't know how that situation was ever even contemplated as something that would be good for Canada. Yeah. Second thing is by him making that public statement that you, uh, you spoke about earlier, that automatically in my mind disqualifies him from being anywhere near any case that will eventually make its way to the Supreme court. He has now in my mind disqualified himself. He has brought himself and the Supreme court into disrepute, disrepute, mm-hmm. By making those public comments, mm-hmm. uh, that was so unbelievably unprofessional, professional, yeah. Yeah. and it should have it should have led to his reg- resignation. Mm-hmm. Now you see, there's some really shady stuff that happened with uh, Justice uh, Brown, and yes. he's no longer on the Supreme Court, which is interesting with him. Right is if you know that case, his background is actually in informed consent. That's one of the areas of law that he's an expert on. Yes. And it's interesting that the one guy on the Supreme Court who is an expert in informed consent is no longer on the Supreme Court. And then then Albertan. Yeah. Yeah. And then Albertan at a time when these cases are going to start percolating to the very top. Well, and to Uh, finish your your thought on on Justice Wagner, you know, a couple of things. uh, You know, firstly, the Supreme Court has refused to hear any appeal dealing with COVID mm-hmm. and, and even yes. ones, uh, significant ones. And secondly, there were a group of lawyers, uh, some friends of mine, who actually filed a complaint with the National, with the Judicial Council of Canada mm-hmm. about yes. Justice Wagner. Here's the problem. Not only was he sitting as the Governor General and the Chief Judge, he was the head of the Judicial Council of Canada. So he's there sitting exactly. on, it, on his own complaint, uh, which was mm-hmm. uh, summarily dismissed. So yeah, they, we've got problems on a lot of different levels. And, and mm-hmm. so this brings me, your, your dissatisfaction with the Emergencies Act inquiry was part of the impetus for you writing the book, right? It was. And I, and I had decided to, uh, to write the book about uh, a couple of months before the inquiry had started. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, in, in the summertime, but I waited six months. I thought long and hard whether I was going to do this. Yeah. And I did decide to reach out to a lot of the key people that I worked with during the convo. And I said, look, I'm thinking about writing a book. Mm -hmm. Do you have an issue with this? Mm -hmm. Um, Because I felt like it's not just my story to tell. And I wanted to make sure that the people that I worked with sort of gave their blessing. And so overwhelmingly, everybody did. I can't think of anyone who said, no, don't. So I started the book and I had a very clear objective in the beginning which was treat it like I, uh, I had a GoPro on my head. So yeah. if the GoPro didn't capture it, it's not going in the book. Yeah. You say, you say that your is, book is not yeah. an historical account. You say, I wanted to make it about the good and the bad, the difficulties, the challenges, what it is like for somebody to get dropped in the middle of a tornado and try to make sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and the other thing, I didn't want to criticize anybody on our side. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. but un- unfortunately, I, I, 
to tell the complete story, I had to tell about the incident, but I just left out the names. Yeah. I thought so you had to be honest, compromise. honest in the telling. Had to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to walk people through everything, what my thought processes were during various uh, weeks, because week after week after week, it seemed like my role kept evolving. Uh, and then the, I, you know, the things that I was involved with were things that I wouldn't necessarily have been involved with at the very beginning when I first arrived, you know, I, I, I don't want to say I quickly moved up the ladder, but I, you know, the ladder formed and, and I ended up going up it. Yeah. So I, that wasn't my intention. I really thought I'm just going to go there make a sustainment plan, make a few spreadsheets, get organized, get a cycle going, a daily routine, and then go home. That's what I thought I could do for, for everybody. But what I found was there was a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Um, there was something desperately missing. And so I, I thought, okay, I need to work on filling that piece. And again, I still had every intention of passing that off to someone else and then going home, but it just, the situation kept fundamentally changing. Yeah. So I had to stay. Yeah. And you know, there was, there was another group, uh, another headquarters I'd like to, you could say, uh, and they were doing great things. And we decided on the first night what we were going to divide up and what they were going to be responsible for, what we were going to take. And that worked out better than expected. Mm -hmm. Um, but really the, the change for me came when Keith and Eva showed up, right? Uh, they, they came with a group of lawyers. Um, but some of the lawyers went back home, weren't required or whatever. I don't know why they went home, but they did. Uh, I'm in contact with some of them. They're great people. Um, but Keith and Eva stuck around for the entire time. And once I connected with them, it was, uh, it was a game changer for me in the role that I was now starting to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. really important that the lawyers showed up. Yeah. I know, I've known Keith a very long time. We were classmates mm -hmm. in, uh, in law school. He had an interesting post the other day about the trial, uh, the mm -hmm. trial. He said the longest and most expensive trial for mischief charges in the history of Canada with no end in sight. Uh, that's, that's yeah. very much, uh, you know, Keith, Keith Wilson. Um, yes. but I want to talk about, you know, your book, uh, and, uh, maybe you don't like this comparison. Hopefully you don't, you don't mind it. Mm. I found that your book was very, very different from Tamara Leach's account. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, both books, both books are worth reading. I would urge people to, mm -hmm. to read them. But yours is a very different uh, type of story to tell. It gives a different insight. Um, but mm -hmm. what's unfair about, about both of them, about what's happened to both of you, is the criticism you've received. And you, you made a post about this on Twitter recently. You said, in the wake of my involvement in the convoy, and subsequent experiences with the POEC, I encountered a profound insight shared by a fellow activist. Uh, some people went to the convoy to do something. Some people went to the convoy to become something uh, with a mm -hmm. poignant warning against the latter as a fool's errand. Um, mm -hmm. Have you received some, some criticism for your involvement in the convoy and, and writing the book yeah. as, as you, you know, you're sort of an opportunist? Um, anybody who's read mm -hmm. the book would not have that impression. But I understand, you know, that maybe that's something that's been leveled at you. Have you has that happened and has it troubled you? Well, uh, from day one of me getting home, I started to receive a lot of criticism. Yeah. Um, and the disappointing part is, you know, if, if they don't have a name on their social media or a photo, if they're not actually standing up and being accounted for by who they are, then I don't engage with it. I, and I stopped doing that a while ago, but... There, the most up upsetting thing is there is a, a core group of people that were at the convoy that did participate in it, that I worked with every day. And so did Chris and Tamara and Keith. There's this core group who have within six months of the convoy ending have been created this camp. And it is no matter what we say or do, this group attacks us mm -hmm. like viciously. Right. viciously and they they constantly lie they make these wild accusations that don't even make any sense 
Uh, they've all been spoken about openly on interviews or at the commission uh, or various other platforms. And what I find is this group of people, um, I, I do the best I can not to retaliate. I mean, I've had a few caveats where I have retaliated because I don't like how they go after people that went to the convoy for the right reasons, which was to save this country from this current government. They weren't people that went there because they were nobodies and now they want to become something, you know, and this is a core group of people that are upset that they are not the face of the convoy, that they're not getting the notoriety of Tamara Leach. Um, you know, they're constantly putting us down to try to elevate themselves. And Mm -hmm. I find that behavior is just disgusting. And no matter how many times I, I bite my tongue every, let's say 50 or 60 to one, I might reply and say, Hey, that's just not cool. Uh, I get attacked for being divisive. (laughs) So it's, it's this thing where it's like, I can't retaliate. I can't defend myself and nobody comes to my defense or Keith's defense. I mean, you know, what yeah. Keith, he's a lawyer and Eva, they can't, they can't get into these online disputes with people that are attacking them on right. baseless things. One of these individuals is actually suing Keith and Eva. Right. Um, while he constantly posts all the evidence on social media for him to get basically annihilated when he gets to court, he's going to get annihilated. And every day he's on social media, giving all the evidence that anyone would need to, to crush his lawsuit. Yeah. In the court of um, opinion, yeah. It, oh, it's, yeah. it's terrible. I mean, it's yeah. all, it's there. He puts it up every single day. Um, one of the other people, he wrote a book, uh, about the convoy. He's gone on in, he, I'm just happy that he apparently bought my book uh, to read because then he went on and said that, yeah, this idiot is, um, yeah, this idiot did exactly what I said he did. And he's admitting it on, uh, in his own book. Yeah. It's like, you weren't even there, buddy. <laughs> you, you don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah. So this is, I, we do get an, a, an exceptional amount of um, uh, personal attacks. Now I will say this from day one, um, it was my observation the first day I arrived that we were too thin on Wellington. Right. And this is, this is an important thing because this is one of the most controversial things that came up during the convoy. And this was a decision that I probably influenced more than anyone else. And it was one of my three priorities. And I talk about my priorities in the book and the priority was Wellington. Right. And it was my absolute belief that the more truckers we had on Wellington actually strengthened our strategic position. So, you know, in terms of, you know, tactics and stuff like that, you have tactics. That's the tactical level that is on the ground, on the street, the tactical situation between us and the police, you've got operational didn't really apply so much here uh, in, in traditional ways, but strategic, we wanted a strategic outcome. That protest was a strategic level protest. It's on the doorstep of the federal government. It doesn't get any higher than that. And so to achieve a strategic outcome, we needed to be right there on Justin Trudeau's doorstep, right? And the liberal government and the NDP, we were not there for tactical purposes. We were unarmed. We were peaceful. We had no interest in deception operations against law enforcement of any kind. We were not there to fight. We were there to peacefully assemble. That's why we were there and to express our objection to what the government was doing to us. Mm -hmm. So when people criticize the fact that, oh my God, you put us all in a, in a, on Wellington so we could be kettled. We could easily be kettled by the police. Well, I'm sorry, but at that point, if the police decide that they are going to go in and make mass arrests, that is a tactical situation. And we were not there for tactical reasons. We weren't there to fight. Right. We were there for strategic reasons. So putting everyone in a, in a line on Wellington to be mass arrested was not the main concern. The concern is we need to put pressure on the federal government and get out of the residential areas. Right. So that the city doesn't have to take the heat. We can put the heat right on the 
prime minister's doorstep. Mm -hmm. That was the strategic objective. Right. There was no tactical objective. And the criticism around being told, oh, you put us all in a turkey shoot to be lined up and kettled. First off, you didn't know what kettling was before the convoy. <laughs> second, yeah. Second, you don't understand what you're doing if you think that you're there for a tactical objective. Right. If you were there for a tactical objective, you should leave because now, now you're talking insurrection. Now you're talking yeah. emergencies act yeah. stuff. Yeah. We didn't want that. That was what we were trying to avoid. And yeah. that's why I work so closely with the lawyers as well yeah. to avoid the pitfalls. Because as I talk about in the book, I was going to put a bunch of tractors on the front lawn of the Supreme yeah. Court. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I listened to legal advice. I understood the strategic outcome to that. Yeah. And, yeah. and so this is where these criticisms comes from these people that really uh, are out of their league. Yeah. Uh, and they're selling themselves as these big, um, you know, general patents and stuff like that. Yes. It's, it's frustrating. I'll be honest. Yes. It's frustrating. Yeah. It must be for someone with military training. Although what you just said does tie into the sort of the last thing I want to ask you about. And that is this. So you posted recently on on X. You said before any everyone starts buying gold and silver, consider investing mm -hmm. in skills, tools, and equipment. Yes. Learn about preserving and growing food year round. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of hardware store sales on things like nails, screws, etc. Seeds. Yes. If you have everything you need, then go back to metals. Now that ties into mm -hmm. something that is a subtle message in your book. You don't hammer on it. But it ties into mm -hmm. something else. A friend of mine named, named Colonel Dave Redman. You probably know who that is. Oh, I know him. Uh, I know and, him. I'm uh, a huge like fan you, of his. Yeah, like mm -hmm. you, a very distinguished military mm -hmm. career. And I was mm -hmm. on a roundtable recently uh, for the National Citizens Inquiry with he and Sean Buckley. And yep. Dave said something to me that kind of rattled me. But it tied mm -hmm. into the way that the Freedom Convoy ended up. You, mm -hmm. you, the use of let's let's call it military police force, mm -hmm. and your your book. And Dave talked about something that in Canada we have taken for granted for a very long time, and that's mm -hmm. public security. And he talked about he talked about you know public security in terms of having a number of different factors. And you'll know what these are from your military training, but most of us lay people are ignorant of these, but. Part of it is the police, part of it is the military, but part of it is just this sense that of this feeling that we're all together and we're living in a in a in a safe society, where we don't have mm -hmm. to worry about being you know uh, out on our streets. Dave is of the view that we're quickly losing that we we that we don't have really a functioning military at this point. Uh, he he mm -hmm. says less than th ten thousand troops. Uh, you know the police are not behaving the way. We've been accustomed that they've that they've behaved in terms of uh, maintaining law and order, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we seem to be at odds. I think we are at odds realistically with our with our governments. Um, and so, is does that is that kind of tying into what you posted there on Twitter? Is kind of a cautionary tale, saying, "Look, folks, don't take this public security for granted. Uh, it's tenuous right now, and we could lose it." Or is that is that going too far? No, I, I think that's a, a great observation because, you know, I, a couple of years ago on, um, I should say maybe a year and a half ago on, on YouTube, I had posted a, a comment on a, on a group talking about metals and all that stuff. And I, and I said, um, you know, wouldn't seeds be more valuable to you in a full out, uh, economic collapse than gold. And the response comment was, yeah, the gold was to buy the seeds dummy. <laughs> he actually <laughs> called me dummy. <laughs> I thought, wow, who's the dummy here? Because you could show up with a donkey cart full of gold and I'm not giving you my seeds for your gold. I can't sure. eat that. I can't grow it. And so uh, you know, my feeling is, uh, cause there are a lot of people and I, like I've said, I, I know lots of groups out there that are, are planning for a full economic collapse because if you just recently watch, um, Pierre Polyev's little documentary video, he did about yeah. the, the housing, uh, I did bubble. See it, yes. you know, I, I've, I've got a master's degree in business and I can tell you he's, he's right on accurate with this one. Um, 
he, the government, the way they have been borrowing money is so excessive uh, that they have put every, our entire economy is in peril. Um, you know, in 2008, you had the Americans with their, their uh, housing crisis. They created that through predatory lending. That was all started under uh, Bill Clinton and it ev- eventually made its way up to George Bush. But we're going to see the same sort of effect because of Justin Trudeau. Yeah. in the future like this is going to catch up with us you can't unring this bell i hate yeah. to to use that kind of thing but you know the amount of interest that people are going to have to pay on the debt um right. is so excessive i would say that in 10 years it's going to be somewhere around 30 cents on every dollar is going to have to be if things stayed the same about 30 cents in every dollar is going to have to be going towards interest payments to banks alone. And what's important to understand about that is that interest doesn't even exist. Interest is not printed into the economy. Interest only exists because you agreed to pay excess money that doesn't physically exist to a bank in exchange for, for money that does exist. Like we don't print interest. We only print principal amounts right. and people have to understand that the interest on loans is fictitious. It do, yeah. You can't touch it. Right. It doesn't exist anywhere. It exists because I say it exists. Right. It exists. Right. So when you look at the, the fact that all of our money, we can't buy houses, we can't afford down payments and we have to pay ridiculous loans back that Justin Trudeau has taken out. Where's that going to leave the economy? It's going to be in trouble. So to go back to your, your earlier question, I think that the, the way of the future, if you want to hedge against all this uncertainty and then economic collapse that Justin Trudeau has been building, and don't forget the important thing, you'll own nothing and be happy about it and be happy. And so what I'm saying is invest in Things that give you skills, should the economy collapse, right. invest in things that are going to insulate you from that eventual collapse. Because I can tell you, mathematically, the economy at some point in the future must collapse. That's what right. the fractured monetary system is. Yeah. And so invest in skills, invest in equipment. When there's a sale on nails, buy them. Uh, when there's a sale on tools, buy them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, buy seeds. You can grow microgreens. I did it all summer. I can grow microgreens and from seed to eating on my plate in seven days, mm. right? A big salad and, right. and get those skills, buy those things so that you're more insulated if things get really out of control. Yeah. So, well, you know, that, that this was is, my uh, point. This is even more concerning uh, than the reality of the situation is the fact that uh, the prime minister and his government are completely disconnected from the reality. In fact, mm-hmm. the prime minister, and you probably saw this, came out, uh, and I don't guffaw, I don't laugh, but he said because his government has been so fiscally responsible, oh. they can actually spend more money. And what are they going to spend mm-hmm. money on? Welfare, uh, which yeah. of course is just you just pouring gasoline on the on the fire. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but you know, Tom, this, uh, this has been a, a really great conversation. I'm so glad that we got to talk with you and learn more about you and your experiences and especially your book, uh, mm-hmm. which, uh, is featured on our reading list. And that's where we are today oh, to wrap up. Good. Uh, your that, book is that's featured. What it, this is what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, and it's yeah. going to be on our web. It's going to be added to our, our reading list. We have a reading list on the show. Thank you. It's called the People's Emergency Act Freedom Convoy 2022, and uh, and as I said, I I read it. I find it's unique among the the several books that I've read about the Freedom Convoy, and uh, I learned many things about what was going on on the ground at the convoy that uh, I would not have understood uh, if if uh, if I had not read this book. Uh, and it's because it's for the reasons that we've uh, that we've learned about from the author. Uh, just his mindset, the way he thinks, his military training, his tactical training, uh, it just gives you a unique understanding of what happened with the Freedom Convoy and also what it means for our country. We've talked about that too. And the book mm-hmm. uh, sort of creates a picture of that. What is What does the convoy mean? Not just what happened. It's not just an historical account. It's a, it's like a what does this mean for us as, as Canadians? So mm-hmm. uh, I can't give it a stronger recommendation than than I already have. The second book, uh, and uh, Tom may have read this one, that I'm going to recommend for our list is called Unvaccinated, How Canada Turned to Hatred and Division. 
Uh, this book uh, is uh, written by Ray Gervin, and uh, it says in 2022, Canada and the world welcomed a new revolutionary technology that was supposed to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, the benefits we may have achieved from this medical breakthrough was overshadowed by the harms it created on our society. And we're living through those right now. Um, and of course, it's important to remember that the convoy came about because of the vaccines and the vaccine mandates. That was an important part of the of the peaceful protest that people like mm -hmm. Tom went there uh, to to express. And of course, uh, as we learned today, uh, even before he went to the convoy, he took a very courageous stand at the college where he was working and essentially gave up his career for what he believed in. Uh, this book similarly, uh, you know, talks about what this what this means for unvaccinated people and for our country. And so uh, I've added that one to our reading list as well. And with that, Tom, I'd like to turn it over to you. Hopefully you have a suggestion or two for our, our viewers and listeners. It doesn't have to be about uh, COVID-19 or the convoy. Any other book that you would recommend uh, that would, would help uh, people gain a better understanding of, uh, of the topics that we've been discussing today with you? Yeah, and I had the pleasure of meeting the author of Fisman's Fraud. Um, oh, yes. Regine, that, yeah, I, I got yes. to meet her a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were in Ottawa, and I think that's a very, very interesting book. Mm -hmm. um, this, this specifically, I think, talks about people involved in the Ontario Science Table yes. and um, the way the scientists not only attacked dissenting vo uh, voices because you know it wasn't no no offense to to you as a lawyer or your profession but sean buckley raised this really fascinating point not long ago he said you know it was lawyers that created all this legislation that wrote amen. these mandates amen you know, we also created and, all um, the woke stuff too that all came out of law school. yes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so so you know the scientists were doing the exact same thing as well yeah. So I think, um, her book is, is really an important discovery that, that Canadians should understand on just how bad the scientific community committed, uh, fraud, yes. uh, and for dissenting scientists, how badly they target them. Like Dr. Bri uh, Byron Bridal, yes. uh, yes. one of the people on the Ontario science table actually started a fake Twitter account and started harassing him. Mm -hmm. and tried to get him fired from his, his tenured teaching job at the University of Guelph yeah. uh, for dissenting opinions. So, you know, again, it's, it's not just the lawyers or the doctors, it's also the scientists who perpetrated this. And there's no point in talking about the media. Um, yeah. uh, from, from what I know, there's 600 new uh, CBC people out looking for jobs. So <laughs> I'm leaving that's that a, alone. That's a, well, I guess that's a, that's a, that's a good, that's, that's like a lawyer joke. You know, what do you call 600 people at the bottom of the ocean or 600 lawyers at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. don't worry. We, we know all, we know all the jokes. That's lawyers. All the jokes. But, yeah. yeah. But actually, uh, uh, Regina, we're actually looking forward to having her on the yeah. show. We're going to be talking about good. her book. I just read it too. And I, I think it's, I agree with you. I think it's just brilliant. Just mm -hmm. like your book is Tom. We're so grateful, uh, for your book and for your time today. Thank you for being our special guest here on gray matter and to talking to us yeah. about your book and all of your work. Uh, you know, it's just a pleasure for me to meet and talk with Canadians like yourself who have shown such tremendous courage in the face of uh, really unimaginable adversity prior to the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic. And uh, it's great to see that uh, you have taken the time to collect your thoughts and document them uh, because I think your book is going to be uh, an important document uh, for posterity. Uh, as I mentioned off the top of the show, I think books like yours, the ones that have been, um, that have been created, uh, are, are sort of going into an anthology that is going to be very, very important, uh, a very, very important part of Canadian history. And so uh, I'm very grateful for your yeah. book and for your time today. Thanks for being with us today yeah. on Gray Mac. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for being one of the lawyers above the surface of the ocean and who is uh, telling the truth because that's yeah. an important thing. You yeah. know, telling the truth is easy uh, to do. It's just hard to be heard. Yes. So thank well you for said. doing it. Very well said. Thanks very much, Tom. It's been our pleasure having you on the program today. Thank you.